Thanks, everyone, for coming. My name is uh, Countinia, and this is Dodd here. Uh, today, we'll be talking about highly available and resilient multi-site deployments using Spinnaker. Uh, so we both are platform architects, but we also like to think of ourselves as uh, crazy hat wearers. Uh, we also have a tradition uh, on, of doing this on Fridays. Uh, we are a distributed team between Philly and uh, DC and Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh. So we kind of try to uh, wear crazy hats, get together and have a stand up every Friday. Uh, my, myself, I'm uh, Count Dinia. I also go by KD. Um, I'm a platform architect. My background is primarily in, uh, has been in product development. I started writing enterprise Java code before I got into networking and I was writing uh, embedded uh, software for embedded systems to eventually getting to a point where my focus turned more towards uh, operators, mainly because I was creating products that helped uh, operators. So today we are going to kind of wear a, uh, do some role play. I'll be the sort of wear the operator's hat. And Dodd, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, Dodd Pfeffer, as Kandini said. Uh, for those of you who don't know the hat that I'm wearing, that's a Philadelphia Fanatic, uh, best mascot in all sports. Um, my background is in application development, enterprise application development, um, and I had the privilege of being a Pivotal Labs customer several years ago, and that really changed the way I thought about writing software and developing software. Um, you know, I started considering things like tests and distributed uh, software development and really have joined or really enjoyed bringing those patterns back to my organization and now working for Pivotal, being able to share that with our customers. So. A little bit about me. So this is a standard safe harbor statement. For the most part, our talk, we have uh, deliberately tried to stay uh, use technology or pieces of technology that are available today that are current. Uh, but there are some portions of it which are close to becoming available. They are in different stages of beta and so on. So this is the safe harbor statement kind of uh, that legal requires us to go through. Um, you can always uh, download a copy of that once you go back home if you're interested. So what we'll talk about today is, um, as engineers, very often it's by default, it's our sort of, uh, it's in our mindset to jump straight in and say, hey, high availability across multiple regions, I'm going to do active-active. Uh, that is sort of the mindset. Uh, but before we actually get into that, what we have seen work is to think about it more holistically rethink how you are going to achieve this high availability, and then we'll get into some of the different factors that you have to take into consideration when you're trying to get this resiliency across uh, multiple geographical regions, um, how the application, the platform, the data, how all this come together, especially as you look at uh, two alternative deployment models, the active-passive and the active-active. And throughout this, we will try to pepper in with uh, tools and best practices and recommendations. Now, all of this stuff that we are going to talk about, whether it's technology or tools or practices, uh, it's all established within a particular framework. And a large part of the credit for this framework goes to uh, the, the Pivotal uh, Customer Zero team. The Customer Zero team at Pivotal, uh, we treat them as the uh, zeroth customer. They validate uh, everything that our product teams are building. And they built a framework uh, which is more, uh, which is all actually captured in a white paper. And the framework is based on using SRE principles and then taking all these different design factors and deciding on what exact deployment topology you will use for a given application. Uh, how many here know about site reliability engineering? Show of hands. Right. Awesome. How many practice this? I think uh, fewer hands here, so I'll quickly summarize uh, what exactly it is and focus on some aspects of uh, SRE as it applies to ensuring uh, high resiliency. Okay. So with site reliability engineering as a practice uh, was first espoused by Google, they still use it today, uh, where reliability is really thought of as an engineering practice rather than an afterthought after getting your applications into production. And Right at the middle of reliability is this sort of tension between users, customers, business, wanting new features, expecting new features, and then reliability kind of 
having this tension that, hey, the system should not change by not changing. It's sort of a zero-sum game between getting new features and reliability. And what reliability engineering does is it plays the game. It tries to figure out how much can I push, how many new uh, capabilities, new features can I actually get in uh, without actually destabilizing, or even if I'm destabilizing the system, it's still within the budget that I've been given. And so intrinsic to SRE is, the, uh, is understanding that failure is normal, embracing the risk, planning for the risk, and you do all of this through uh, a structured, uh, structured framework where you have service level objectives that you agree to with your uh, business owners, and that derives an error budget within which you uh, actually establish um, uh, the new capabilities. Right? So the challenge really is in balancing that change and reliability. Uh, so this is a really neat illustration. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Corey, is, uh, Corey is right here. Corey Innes, he's one of our practitioners here. Uh, this is an illustration that uh, the credit goes to him. That really lays out very well why site reliability engineering is important. Uh, very often, uh, as technologists, as I said, we jump into the most uh, reliable, the most scalable systems, uh, but it's all about economics. It's about balancing the... Uh, economic needs of your business with uh, what you actually engineer. So in this graph here, on the, uh, the x-axis, you have the reliability, the service level indicator. This is a metric that uh, represents the objective that your uh, business has set for you. And the y-axis uh, kind of represents the uh, cost and effort, right? So as you start going further right in the, um, in your, as far as your SLI is concerned, you start seeing the cost and effort actually starts growing exponentially. And the, the likelihood that anyone notices that reliability is not up to the mark uh, is it actually starts, um, it starts dropping as you start uh, go achieving, trying to shoot for higher and higher uh, SLIs. Now, the, real, the chance that someone actually cares about it is probably going to ha happen before. So you don't want your users to start dropping off your, say, um, of your website, e-commerce website, uh, just silently. So you do need to kind of understand this uh, early on. Now, when it comes to managing this change and reliability, uh, the, it, it's really helpful to think of in terms of error budget, even though as a metric, mathematically speaking, error budget is just the inverse of that, whatever that service level objective is, but as humans, it makes it so much easier to actually grasp this. So one interesting thing, if you look at going from 99% of SLO to 99.9%, .9%, that's just like a 0.9% difference, the actual error budget is almost a tenth from approximately seven hours, you're down to 40 minutes. What that means is as you start shooting for these higher and higher levels of uh, service level uh, resiliency, the error budget, how much uh, room, wiggle room you have for messing things up, kind of goes down. Now, how do you kind of relate this to the various practices is, uh, if you look at that error budget in a rolling 28-day uh, sort of uh, window, uh, the at lower sort of um, SLOs, you can simply say, hey, I just need to be alerted by the uh, user complaint. It's totally uh, human in the loop. There's no automation, but for the service level objective, that's what I'm going to guarantee. Now, as you start pushing for higher SLOs, there's more and more capabilities you need to uh, start hitting. Uh, for example, for 99.9 person, you want the alerting to be automated. Uh, you have comprehensive monitoring. There's, uh, there's an operations team, production ops team that automatically, uh, that actually reacts to this. And then you start getting into the 99.95 or the four nines, and you need to all uh, start having automated rollback and automatic failover. So as you can see, as you keep going to the right, the level of effort starts going exponentially higher. And this is all about economics. So the more you spend, as you're going from 99.9 to 3.9s to 4.9s, the spend also goes up. Right? Now, I'm not saying all of this for you to shy away from doing active-passive or active-active deployments, uh, but to always think in the within, within this context. Right Now, the... 
Sources of risk for, uh, for reliability are many. There could be changes to the application, the configuration. This is just a big laundry list. Uh, now, I will come back to that in a little bit, a small framework that our customer zero team has uh, come up with that will help you uh, understand what sort of uh, service level objectives to use. Uh, but it is required to first talk a little bit about the deployment topologies before I get back to showing you how that framework uh, actually uh, is used. So the active-passive deployment, uh, here you have two foundations. You have an uh, active foundation, in this case, in the west, and a passive foundation, in, case, uh, in this case, in, um, uh, in the east. Uh, right now, here in this picture, I'm representing pivotal application services. For the most part, you can achieve similar sort of capabilities uh, even with PKS. Right? So the reference architecture within any of those regions, that's the standard reference architecture we have there, multiple uh, subnets, multiple uh, if you need an additional isolation segment and so on. The things that are interesting outside of a regular single region is the global load balancer. There is a DNS-based global load balancer that is front-ending your application that is pointed to the active uh, foundation's local load balancer, that regional load balancer. Now, in this sort of context, there's still data replication happening from one region to another, and the passive region is still getting data, and as and when there is any sort of um, failure scenario, the, dynam the DNS global load balancer can either dynamically or through uh, automation uh, cut over to the uh, passive foundation. Now here, the, the passive foundation, you already have the data because you're replicating it. The only thing you would have to do is really start up your applications and they're ready to absorb your user's traffic. Now there too, you can go to different extreme, uh, different sort of um, conditions. The Dodd will talk a little bit about that, uh, how much readiness you have within your applications. For example, you can start the CF push when the cutover happens, or you can just go ahead and stage the applications, but not actually start the application instances, and only start them up when the DR occurs. It all depend, goes back to that SLO that we spoke about. What is the SLO? What is the turnaround that you're looking for? <clears throat> now, for most of our customers, we say this is probably the right choice for most applications, because just with active passive, you can typically offer anywhere from 99.5% uh, or greater than that uh, SLO, uh, because it's not just the multi-site nature of this, but even within a given region, the, um, all the HA built into the platform ensures that you are already high up there, right? So by default, for most uh, applications, we believe this is the right choice, but things, things vary. And even if you believe this is not the right choice, this is a good place to start before you move to active-active. Now, the difference with active-active is uh, you have application instances, potentially the same number of application instances running in both places, and you have your DNS global, uh, DNS-based global load balancer sending traffic to both east and west, and a lot of this global load balancers tend to also support geo-affinity, so your custom users in the West Coast can uh, just get directed to the ones in the West and um, the others in the East. Now, one thing that I did not mention when I was talking about active-passive is uh, to also plan for capacity when the failover happens. So if your failure has not happened for a long, long time, it means you have, uh, if you do not have the same capacity on both sides, when you cut over, you may suddenly run out of uh, enough resources on your, uh, on your passive uh, location, which also means as a practice, as an SRE practice, uh, you need to uh, do chaos testing and actually uh, test this out. Uh, I want to quickly show you a couple of things. Uh, I never expected I would demonstrate um, a spreadsheet, but these two spreadsheets are pretty cool. Uh, so the white paper that I spoke about uh, from the Customer Zero team, they actually have reference to two worksheets, one for active-passive and active-active. Now, what that captures is, um, so this is the active-passive one. So what that captures is, on the left here, it's a table of different conditions uh, that potentially introduce risk in your platform. And on the top right here, the column CDF represent different service level objectives. Let me make it a little bigger for people in the back. And the color coding here kind of tells you 
if I am at, if I expect four nines of uh, SLO, all this risk, everything that is in red here, I am not able to absorb. If, for example, there is um, any sort of um, a new release breaks certain things, if I want to still ensure that level of uh, HA, um, I'm not going to be able to accomplish this. So, for example, here, if I uh, fill up this spreadsheet saying, hey, I, there's going to be, there's unnoticed growth in the actual usage, and I have not planned for capacity. Now, let's say that's a factor that I'm willing to take risk. Now, that immediately changed your budget, uh, sort of what, it sets your budget at 52 minutes per um, year, but it also said, hey, this is the unallocated budget right now that I can play with. What is the additional risk? For example, if I want to say the operator is slow at debugging this, now that immediately tells me that this, um, my error budget, I have exceeded my error budget. So even if these are the ex not exact set of uh, risk that you have. This is a nice framework where you can figure out what are the risks that is acceptable based on the environment where I'm deploying to. I'm deploying to the public cloud, so I don't expect, uh, let's say, power failure. Then you can say I'm going to factor that out, but there are other risks that are specific to you in your environment. You can incorporate that into your analysis. And you can, there's a spreadsheet like this for active passive as well as active active. So you can actually work with your business owners or your app owners and figure out what is the SLO that you want to actually establish. It's a really nice, um, opinionated, not overly, but opinionated way of uh, establishing SLOs. Um, I'll wrap up quickly here and hand it off to Dodd. Um, there are a few factors that you have to think about in the context of multi-site resiliency. Uh, we believe there are three of them, application, data, and platform to begin with. From an application standpoint, what is the impact on the end users, and especially for platform operators in the room, need to actually separate this out from the CF push availability of the platform. You can have a different SLO for the application itself, but an entirely different SLO for the actual CF push experience. Now, data is the tricky one. Uh, Dodd, therefore, I'm going to let Dodd talk about <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, data is definitely a tricky one, but there are some really interesting, really um, uh, impressive solutions there. From a platform standpoint, I'll revisit this uh, towards the end, it becomes super important to make sure that your different regions are consistent in their versions, in their configuration to the extent possible, and you're always backing up, you're always patching, you're always upgrading, and how do you ensure this consistency is something I'll talk about a little bit later. And then there are other factors outside of these three, for example, your infrastructure, what your IaaS uh, sort of has to offer. Uh, for example, today we are going to use uh, Azure for our demonstration, and Azure uh, provides certain capabilities that I would uh, use, but in a different IIS, you would have to figure out how am I going to accomplish this. All right. Thanks, Kandinya. And uh, boy, am I happy you're taking care and considering all these risk factors uh, underneath my application. Um, just to give you a little bit of roadmap of where we're headed over the next uh, 10, 15 minutes or so, we're going to be taking a look at the Spring Pet Clinic application across um, app level characteristics, high availability and observability. Then we'll take a look at the data characteristics that Kandinya had uh, suggested we would get into, both on cluster data stores and WAN replication across multiple sites. Then we're going to take a, a spin through how we're going to keep our applications up to date across multiple sites and looking at the concerns of CI, CD, and application inventory, and then also some sophisticated deployment techniques we can use because we've added observability into our application. So I want to introduce Spring Pet Clinic. You may have seen this as a demo in previous Spring One platforms or even other talks uh, at this conference. Uh, it is a representative of a business application that I know I've written in the past, and many of you likely have, where we've focused on business functionality, right? Not necessarily the NFRs. We made a decision to leverage the Spring Framework so that we can focus on that business logic and allow the framework to solve our common needs. Like many of um, applications as they get started, um, it's written in uh, a monolithic form with a relational database backend. That's how we could get up and running quickly and start meeting the needs of our business. 
Now, our business users have learned to love this and became critical in terms of the ability for the pet clinic to operate and meet its customers and serve its customers. Uh, the hours of availability have increased. The need for this app always being up and running have increased. And we've also needed to expand with additional sites uh, across the country and be able to satisfy if we had a failure within our data centers in a given region that we can still operate and meet the needs of our customers, right? So a a as the application has grown, the demands of non-functional requirements has also grown. Now, I've learned what Caldinia had talked to us about SRE. The platform has certain objectives that it needs to meet, and I wanna be able to apply those to my application as well. And Spring has made that very easy with Actuator and Micrometer, and we can consume a whole lot of app kind of system level stats but what I wanna do is also work with my business to find out what are the most important business transactions to them and be able to incorporate that into the metrics that I'm pulling and surfacing that back up. And for that, I'm using Datadog. So let's jump into a little bit and see what I've had to do to the application to incorporate business level custom metrics. So how many uh, application developers do we have in the room? Right. How many platform operators? That's a reasonable Good mix. representation, yeah. So in order to help instrument my application, I'm using the actuator dependency as well as the micrometer datadog dependency. Because I've met with my business and this uh, finding owners is an important business transaction, I can go right into the method that drives that process and annotate that with the timed annotation, which is gonna capture the response time for that method and surface that back up in a meaningful metric name called the find, uh, owner's find time. I can flip back to, excuse me, Datadog and can see that I can start incorporating those metrics into a nice dashboard that I can put up as an information radiator and we can constantly be tracking the you know, healthiness of this important business metric. Another thing I wanna mention, in order to send this information out to Datadog, I'm leveraging properties. And in order to authenticate and register my API key of where I'm sending, I have to store that in a property. Now, by leveraging the platform, I wanna take advantage of storing that credential information in CredHub, and I can leverage the CredHub service broker that the Pivotal platform offers. And you can see here, I'm referencing VCAP services, the name of the service, the uh, CredHub service that's bound to my application, and then the particular keys. I was able to do this, if I jump to README, with a simple, well, let me just, with a simple create service call of the CredHub service, and then I can pass the important credential information. So already I'm leveraging the platform to help me write some secure code. Not necessarily high availability topic right there, but something that I wanted to share with you as, as it was helpful for me as I'm sharing this code with all of you, but I wanna keep those secrets uh, personal to myself. Now the next aspect that I wanted to cover with the Spring Pet Clinic is high availability within the application. So we've designed this using Spring Boot. Uh, we've considered some 12-factor principles in order to scale horizontally, so we're friendly in that manner. Um, but I don't wanna have the concerns of managing the infrastructure of the cloud runtime that I wanna deploy my application to. So I'm gonna use Pivotal Platform that Caldinia and his team has set up for me. Pivotal Platform is gonna allow me to run multiple instances of my application, be able to scale those, and when I run multiple instances, we'll deploy them on different virtual machines assigned to different availability zones that the platform has been de uh, defi uh, defined for. If my application crashes, Pivotal Platform's gonna restart that application for me, and then underlying the Pivotal Platform, Bosch is providing those same uh, assurances and self-healing for the Pivotal Platform software itself in terms of processes on the VMs, or if a VM were to fail, Bosch will resurrect that. So just by leveraging the Pivotal Platform, I'm getting a great sense of high availability for my application within a given region. 
And you know, that's been really helpful in terms of me being able to focus my developer's time on the business logic of the application and letting the platform handle aspects of high availability that I would otherwise have to concern myself with. So we talked about the app. Uh, we talked about it, adding instrumentation and observability of the app and the high availability, but how about the data? Caldina said that in our framework, we need to be concerned about the data. So initially this was written for a uh, MySQL database, a relational database, um, and that served us well, but by observing the data access patterns of this application, um, I've seen that I may be able to take advantage of an in-memory caching. A lot of reads are occurring, and I want performance and speed that the in-memory cache may be able to supply to me. Um, so I've been thinking about in-memory cache. Um, I don't want to um, I don't want to forget that if I were to stick with my uh, relational database needs, that the first party services for Pivotal MySQL can give me high availability within a foundation with a leader follower plan and a clustered service plan. But because I've been, already been thinking about the, the, the caching solution, I've been looking at Pivotal Cloud Cache as that is a first party service that you can get and deploy to uh, the Pivotal platform. When we look at the data high availability, Pivotal Cloud Cache stripes cache servers through a Bosch, uh, Bosch deployed uh, self-service on-demand service, uh, striping cache servers across multiple availability zones and allows me to define my data regions with replication so that those could be distributed across multiple servers. Locators are an important aspect to the Pivotal Cloud Cache technology and those are also spread across availability zones. So again, within a given region, I can get a high level of high availability and resiliency with my cloud cache, and that sounded great to me. And I love the idea that I can go ahead and provision that myself in a self-service nature. But we talked about wanting to extend to multiple sites, and that's another challenge that I need to solve for that Pivotal Cloud Cache can help me with. So through WAN replication, um, Pivotal Cloud Cache uses asynchronous events and gateway technologies to synchronize data in a bi-directional way across multiple cloud cache clusters, and in this case, can be deployed across east and west foundations. Another aspect of cloud cache that I don't want to um, I, I don't want to minimize is the ability that this can actually be a system of record. I don't need to only use a caching system as a look aside or a session cache, but I can store my critical business data like the data in, in the pet clinic. So we can persist data to disk so that if a cache server were to fail, it can rehydrate. It spreads the data across multiple nodes. We have Bosch protecting and resurrecting uh, those cache servers if they were to go down. So lots of capability just within Pivotal Cloud Cache in terms of single site, high availability, and with the WAN gateway, multiple site, high availability. So now we have the apps and data. I thought I'd take you for a spin through the application. We have a foundation deployed in Azure East and Azure West. Um, I'm gonna first go, you can see my URL here, is pinned to, or it designates the East. I'm going to uh, do a search of existing owners, and since I'm in the east, and we have the play baseball playoffs going on, I'm gonna choose to add an owner, and we'll choose Anthony Rendon to honor our, Nash or our uh, Washington Nationals. Yeah, if I can spell it. We have a crazy phone number here, and we'll add Anthony Redknown. Then we'll go over to the West environment, and we'll do a search, we'll find owners, and we see Anthony's been added. We know we're in the West, because we're tagged here with West, and we have the West URL. Likewise, if I go and don't want to leave our West Coast Dodgers out, we'll do Chris Bellinger. Any Dodger fans here? I guess not. All right. 
So now we've added Chris Bellander on the West Foundation, and if we go over to the East, we find donors. We can see that Bellinger is showing up in the East. So this data is being written to Pivotal Cloud Cache clusters on either side of the United States. The WAN replication is doing bi-directional replication as well. So this has been helpful if I know that I want to go to the East URL, if I want to go to the West URL, but in Candina's picture, he highlighted a global load balancer. So he's been kind enough to set that up for us, and if I go to a URL that matches the global load balancer, I should be able to find that data as well. Now, this global load balancer is uh, geographically aware based off of latency. Uh, we can see that in Austin, I'm being surfaced by the prod west, and I can see all the data that's, been, um, that's available in my owner's list view. If I go ahead to a virtual machine on the Amazon East Cloud and go to the same URL, I can see that I can get to the application and it, this is being served from the east. Various ways that you can handle a highly available multi-site deployment and being able to distribute traffic across those foundations. Um, let's see here. One thing I wanted to show is I mentioned that the application was built for a MySQL backend. However, I wanted to implement Pivotal Cloud Cache. So to be able to refactor the application, given the abstractions that Spring um, provides to us and were used initially, it wasn't very difficult at all. Um, I simply added, let's go here to the dependency. Instead of the Spring Data JPA, I'm using Spring Data G uh, Gemfire Starter. And then if I go to my domain objects owner, instead of having entity, uh, annotations, I'm using region annotations. And then if I go to my repository, I'm extending the Gemfire repository instead of what was the JPA repository. I get the benefits of the out-of-the-box methods, uh, the CRUD-oriented methods, and then I can define my own queries as well into this interface. So Spring has made it very easily um, for me as an application developer to swap backends in this case. Just a quick note, uh, the concept of region within Geode or Pivotal Cloud Cache has nothing to do with the multi-site. No. It's a region just means, think of it as a table, uh, like a NoSQL table. Thanks, Handine. All right, so let's get back to the few other topics. We covered the high availability from the app perspective and the data perspective, but how do I keep my application, now it's being deployed many instances in non-prod environments, I'm deploying to the east, I'm deploying to the west, how do I manage configuration drift? And by taking a look at the entire delivery pipeline, you may see the slide in a, in a few of the other talks at this conference, um, but these are the common stages of how my code, once I do a git commits, gonna end up in the various uh, production environments, right? On the left-hand side, and what we're looking and trying to focus with is there's unique attributes of the pipeline within the continuous integration phase. Um, here is your code changes, you're running your unit tests, your integration tests, and your creation of an artifact. Once that artifact is created and published, then we can really consider how is that gonna get deployed across multiple spaces, multiple organizations, multiple regions, right? And that's our continuous delivery flow. We draw this line and we think about the unique needs here, we can look at purpose-built tools that can help satisfy and help us with the aspects of that delivery pipeline. Um, we'll get to Spinnaker in a moment, I wanna go left to right. On the continuous integration front, what we've built out is a concourse pipeline. If I go to the Spring Pet Clinic here, uh, I have a fairly simple pipeline. I'm gonna pull a trigger off of a code commit on the Git repo. I'm gonna do unit tests. If those unit tests pass, I'm gonna go into the build and publish phase. And there I'm gonna go ahead and build my Java artifact and then use the Spring Artifactory resource to push my Java artifact into Artifactory. I'm also gonna version my code along the way so that that's getting bumped. Once this trigger has occurred into Artifactory, I'm entering the world of Spinnaker, and I'll go through the Spinnaker pipeline. But let me introduce Spinnaker 
First, what Spinnaker does for us is it gives us an inventory and the ability to do pipelines. So my app is now distributed in multiple regions, multiple sites. It's harder to keep track of what's being deployed, and I may need to take action on those apps that have been deployed. Spinnaker gives you a real nice inventory feature where we can see what versions of my apps are deployed to which sites. On top of that, I can design pipelines in a tool that's specifically designed to help with deployments and actions on the applications that have been, uh, that you can see in your inventory. So this stateful nature of Spinnaker is something that uh, CI tool doesn't necessarily have and specifically Concourse ha doesn't have, but that's fine because we're choosing the right tool or the most appropriate tool in my use case for each of these aspects of CI and CD. One thing that we'll see when we get into Spinnaker is the use of automated canary analysis. So uh, because we have instrumented our application with meaningful business metrics that are important to our business, we want to let that help inform our deployment processes so that we can protect the SLO of that particular you know, business metrics as I'm doing deployments. And if a code change were to disrupt the meaning, in a meaningful way the SLIs or the SLOs that I've set, then I want to go ahead and uh, back out that deployment or never complete the deployment um, and then be able to delete that um, you know, canary version or the next version of my application. So we'll see how that's integrated in the Spinnaker pipeline. Now, um, one thing to note, uh, Spinnaker is for a, a mature microservices or mature app team, um, particularly some of these benefits. If you haven't uh, instrumented your application, you're not aware of the metrics, you may not get some of the additional value out of this. So there's a little bit of a, you know, let's make sure that you really have a good sense of the metrics that your app um, are tracking and what good looks like, and Spinnaker can help uh, use those metrics in a powerful way. So I'm going to jump into Spinnaker here. First, we'll take a look at the infrastructure. Um, we can see here that I have uh, an East Foundation and a West Foundation. Uh, east and West here, we have Prod, Test, and Prod. So I'm only doing Test in my East Foundation. Um, I have the ability, given uh, metadata that I've defined about the application, the inventory, to filter and you know just look at various deployed aspects of the application. I can also see details and the number of instances and whether they're up. These are the actual GUID of the app on the Pivotal platform. If I pick a particular deployed application, I can take action. Hmm. Let's see what happened there. Pardon me. Uh, yeah. The cert. There we go. All right, so now I can see uh, information about that app, how many instances it are, um, services that it's bound to. I can go ahead and scale that app, resize it, so there's some actions that I can take um, directly on the application, or I could be observing metrics and develop pipelines that will take action on the application right through Spinnaker. That's the, the inventory aspect of Spinnaker. Now, when I look at the delivery pipeline, and we have a few that have gone. You can see uh, I had a code commit earlier today triggered based off of Artifactory. This was the name of my jar file um, that Spinnaker was able to observe and kick off a pipeline. Um, and I can drive into details of the various steps that are within this pipeline. In order to get a closer look at the pipeline, though, I'm going to give you the uh, configure view. So Spinnaker allows you, with tasks that are very common in a deployment pipeline, to create a dependency graph of steps and stages that you want to use. Uh, in this case, my first thing I'm going to do is deploy to a test space in the East environment. Um, and when I go here, it's important, right, because I'm doing the, the metrics and observability that ultimately are going to be looked at by Spinnaker, that I'm going to have to tag that deployment with some data that Datadog can use to know that this is come from, coming from the test environment. Um, and we can see that I have a deployment type equals test. I'm binding the services to Pivotal Cloud Cache and CredHub, and here's some other information that you might uh, see is familiar with the Cloud Foundry manifest. If 
I go back. Once I do that deployment, I want to test. This is in my test environment. I want to test to make sure, smoke test to make sure that that deployment um, satisfies a, a minimal set of criteria. In this case, I'm taking advantage of something in Spinnaker called a job. And in that run job task, what I've defined is a Kubernetes job that is going to git clone my integration test or my smoke test git repository and then run the Maven clean verify with the profile P, uh, profile of end to end. So this job is going to get scheduled on the Kubernetes cluster that Spinnaker is running on and start making requests against my application and test. Assuming that that passes, I can move along in an automated way and do a canary deployment in the prod. So when you're doing your canary deployments, you're actually going to deploy two instances of your application. This is a particular technique uh, that, that Spinnaker supports, or there could be others. But I'm going to bring um, the new version of my application and deploy that right into production. And then I'm going to take the a new instance of the previous version of my application and add that to production. I had four instances in East. So at this stage, what's going to happen, I'm going to have six instances of the application, one of them being the new version. And in the manifest associated with these, I've given the environment variable that tags it as a baseline or a canary, so that as the data is flowing in the data dog, that those metrics can be isolated. The canary analysis stage is the next part where I'm really hooking in to the ability of Spinnaker to start listening and observing from Datadog the metrics that have been captured. Uh, this is fairly simplistic, but I'm running um, over three minutes, a initial warm-up period where I'm going to allow those baseline and canaries to ex be accepting traffic, and I'm going to measure for a minute, and then um, I'm going to wait measure for another minute, wait, and constantly be gathering that data. And then I can do statistical analysis of that data to see if there's any deviations um, that are unacceptable to me. And that's all configured within, within Spinnaker in the Canary configs and the Canary reports. Uh, assuming that's gone well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the new version of my application and deploy it to the production east region. And I'm going to delete the Canary and baseline instances so I go back down to the four instances that I was interested in and then I'm going to go deploy to the West region. So it's a, a rolling deployment, uh, making sure in an automated way everything I've done is in Spinnaker, but getting that app uh, deployed to uh, our, my East and my West foundation. I'll just give you a, a, a quick look. You may see this in some of the other uh, presentations. If I go back to pipelines, yes, that's OK. That canary analysis run we can see that these are actual reports. This is measuring against the fine owner's time average. This is uh, the one that my business has indicated to me has uh, most meaning for them. And I'm making sure that the baseline, which is a previous version of my app and my new one, you know, don't have a significant deviation in this metric. And I can allow the, uh, the continuation of my pipeline and roll out of the deployments. So that is just one way that you can de define pipelines. Um, you know, certainly, depending on unique characteristics of your organization, uh, you, can, uh, you can design these. You could do some canaries out in the West. You know, lots of flexibility there. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting as I was going through this, and we'll have a link to the, the code, um, is all of the concourse tasks and pipelines are available in, in the CI directory of the Git repo. But I've also stored the uh, Spinnaker pipeline as well as code as Spinnaker um, it allows you to use the spin CLI to interact with a number of the API endpoints. And I've stored those pipelines that are defined as part of the Git repo. Um, you can take a look at that. And then there are some helpful scripts that I've used to either uh, push my Spinnaker config using the spin CLI. And then for the canary aspects, that's not been exposed in the spin CLI yet. So I had to directly integrate with the Spinnaker API. But this will pull from configuration as code push this into Spinnaker so that my app and its whole pipeline uh, are up and running. And then likewise, if you made some manual changes in the UI and you wanted to pull the latest configuration, there's a script to pull that down too. So if you guys want to play around with that, you're welcome to do so. That's what we have from the app perspective. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about the foundations that you've set up and, yep. and how that works? Great. 
Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, there was a session, I think it was yesterday, square pegs and square holes, CICD, that fits. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, checking out uh, the recording when it's up on YouTube. Uh, Madhav Sate and uh, Korai Bukil, they are the speakers. Uh, I do recommend checking it out. Uh, they have sort of more prescriptive uh, sort of guidance around how you build your pipelines whether they are in concourse or whether they are in uh, Spinnaker. So I, I do recommend you go check it out. So going back to my role, putting on the platform operator's hat, uh, early on I said uh, there, in addition to application and data, there's the platform factor. Uh, there are certain factors around the platform. How do you ensure consistency of the platform itself? Um, and there are certain other set of uh, factors related to the infrastructure you're deploying on. In, for our setup, as Dodd mentioned earlier, we are deployed in Azure East and West. Uh, now, you do need a DNS uh, global load balancer. We are doing an active-active um, sort of uh, configuration here. And you also need to figure out the actual physical layer plumbing. How are you going to actually get connectivity between these uh, different regions? In my case, in our case, we just used uh, global VNet peering. Uh, when you need to, in Azure, when you need to connect VNets that are in two different regions, you need uh, global VNet peering. So that's what we have actually used. And the last part, as innocuous as it seems, around having really, uh, the same identical release versions between the platforms can be a challenge, and I will show you how uh, we've actually used platform automation to uh, accomplish that. So this is a slightly modified picture, more closer to what we have deployed. Um, Azure East and Azure West, and we have the global uh, VNet peering occurring here. And on the front end, for the, actual, for the global load balancer, we actually use the Azure Friend Door. Uh, the Azure Friend Door uh, is a layer seven um, is a layer seven load balancer, and based on the, I've actually set it up to use the uh, latency-based routing. So wherever the uh, lowest latency is going to be uh, achieved for that particular user. That's where the traffic gets routed to, unless that region itself is uh, totally unavailable, in which case uh, it will just route to the, uh, to the other active uh, site. So now getting to the platform automation, um, quick show of hands, how many folks, uh, how many teams here use platform automation as it is known today? I see a couple, few hands going up here and there. Uh, so Hopefully this is not too new information, but I still have something useful, uh, I think, for you. So platform automation is a, a bunch of uh, building blocks that we provide. Uh, it comprises of uh, concourse tasks. So you take all these different concourse tasks and uh, put them together into concourse pipelines. We also provide some reference pipelines. Now, the... The pipelines and the various tasks, they actually use Ops Manager API. So rather than what you were doing, uh, say, using the previous generation PCF pipelines or manually where you were going into the UI and setting things up, uh, platform automation uh, basically provides you a CI and CD pipeline for that. Now, the really interesting thing is there are a couple of different ways of uh, using platform automation. Uh, there's what we call reverse and forward engineering. Uh, Dodd and so am I are big fans of the forward engineering uh, sort of idea where you can actually introspect, you can ask Ops Manager, hey, what are all the different configuration settings using an API or a script? You can figure out what are all the different configuration settings, and then only pick the ones that you want to override, the ones that you want to actually configure, uh, as opposed to uh, setting up the actual configuration in Ops Manager and then exporting that. That's what we would call a reverse engineering sort of approach. Uh, what we use is a forward engineering approach, and that's all captured in a GitHub repo that we will share as well. And the nice thing about platform automation is that it is IaaS agnostic, so whether you're deploying to um, Azure, e, uh, Azure or AWS or vSphere, the actual pipeline definitions and the tasks they are, can all be consolidated to be just one single set of uh, artifacts. It's really the configuration that you would actually be changing as you're moving from one IaaS to another, and uh, there's a really nice opinionated way to do this. So today for uh, our actual deployment, and uh, as this is the common pattern that you will see even in, uh, in the field, is the actual platform automation engine, uh, Concourse itself, needs to run some place, some place for platform operators to use. And we have an opinionated deployment for that called Platform Automation Engine. 
Uh, you may, if you have heard of the term control plane before, uh, this is the new name for it. We like changing names. Uh, so this is today, I believe, in uh, closed beta. Uh, so this is an opinionated deployment of Concourse, UAA, and Cred Hub, all the three things that are needed to enable platform automation to work. And uh, this is something uh, that our product teams are uh, looking to get out there. So let me give you a quick run through of uh, platform automation before I get to the, uh, nether, uh, the next uh, cool new thing uh, that's coming out. So this is my GitHub repo. Let me make that a little bigger. So uh, this GitHub repo itself is going to be shared. Uh, so don't worry if about um, you know, taking any uh, pictures of this. So the way this is set up is we have a three pipeline definition um, uh, sort of uh, three pipeline definition. Um, YAML files, so basically two of them that you would typically use. There's the ops manager and director pipeline YAML, and then there's a standard uh, product pipeline YAML. So those two pipeline definitions basically drive everything else uh, as far as um, uh, platform automation is concerned. So let me quickly switch here. So this is my platform automation engine. So this is where I have the various pipelines for deploying, managing the life cycle of my two foundations on the east and west. So this is the, these are the pipelines uh, for the east, and these are the pipelines for the west, where I can go in and manage the entire life cycle, not just of PKS and PaaS, but Ops Manager itself. So from scratch, you can actually deploy Ops Manager, Bosch Director, everything in a 100% automated, repeatable fashion. Uh, so this is, an, um, as I mentioned, somewhat of an opinionated uh, view of how platform automation pipelines should be assembled. So this starts with um, basically picking up the, uh, the, the configuration for the various stages, for the various stages within the pipeline. It locks the foundation, locks the foundation in the sense it's more of a semaphore saying, hey, if someone else actually triggers the same pipeline, uh, just block that till this pipeline uh, completes to its uh, execution. So you just lock the, um, that particular foundation from an upgrade standpoint, validate very quickly, validate the actual configuration of the, uh, of the pipeline. Uh, do you have all the data sets? Do you have all the variables, secrets, all of that set up, all of that available? And uh, this quickly validates that before it actually gets to uh, installing Ops Manager itself. Now, this pipeline has already run, um, and, but you can, uh, if you're familiar with Concourse, you can go back and look at uh, all the historical information about what exactly happened. So this uh, automatically pulled in the uh, various images, the various images and tasks that are packaged as part, of, uh, as part of platform automation. All of that is available on PivNet network.pivotal.io, so this is automatically pulling those images, pulling those tasks, um, reusable tasks, doing the cred hub interpolation, meaning understanding, hey, what are all the actual configuration settings, including secrets um, that I need to use, and then went ahead and from PivNet actually downloaded the Ops Manager um, Azure VM image, deployed it, and uh, started, uh, it then went on to actually uh, configuring the authentication, the Bosch director, and so on and so forth, and applying those changes. So this is, this is all based on the actual pipeline that, um, one of these uh, pipeline.yaml. It's based on this, so this is available for you to uh, pull down from GitHub as well. Now, sort of an equivalent of this is for the various product, the various styles within Ops Manager. Uh, so let's say you need to deploy uh, CF, or you need to deploy PKS, or you need to deploy SPCC. So there is just one single, uh, in this opinionated view of uh, how to do platform automation, there's just one single uh, pipeline.yaml, and the, it follows the same pattern where you lock the foundation, you then go ahead and validate the configuration, download the Tile as well as the, uh, any stem cell that it has a requirement on, stage it, configure it, apply the changes, and once those changes are applied, we basically unlock that tile. So this same one single 
uh, sort of pipeline.yaml, you make multiple copies of pipelines. So for example, this is the pipeline for deploying uh, Pivotal Cloud Cache to the east. If you look at the boxes, they're exactly the same. What uh, would differ is what's within this, what exactly that we are configuring. Uh, for instance, with um, PCC, I actually configured all these different settings, and um, it, it just makes the, uh, this is how you accomplish that consistency between the various foundations. Now, this is based on uh, the GitHub repo that I uh, spoke about here. Uh, one quick thing I will show you, the thing that varies between each one of those pipelines or each one of those uh, foundations is uh, the configuration. So this folder here basically captures everything, um, all the configuration information. For example, uh, all my Azure East and West uh, configuration is all in is all within this particular folder, and this is all in just one single GitHub repo. And there are a few different con ways this is organized. If you go check out the GitHub repo, it should help, uh, or also work with your platform architects, and they can also help you with this. Um, uh, reliability view. Do you want to hit yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. One more quick thing about uh, the, the, this platform automation uh, uh, is around upgrades, upgrades not just from minor versions, but also ma uh, major versions where you can very quickly run uh, a script that'll tell you, hey, what are the new configuration settings that have come up or what has been taken away, uh, where defaults have changed uh, so that you can very quickly understand what's the impact of upgrade and also plan for that accordingly. All right. So the next new thing that's, uh, that we wanted to quickly go over is around the observability. Now, Dodd spoke about observability from the standpoint of uh, the application. So there's some new, uh, new capabilities coming out on the platform observability side as well, and that's the uh, reliability view for PCF. Uh, reliability view is really under the hood, uh, basically Prometheus and Grafana, and it allows for a more federated approach where you can deploy reliability view on the control plane or uh, the platform automation engine, as we call it now, and they are exporters deployed on each of the foundations, each of the sites, uh, for example. So you could have a reliability view exporter for Pivotal application service deployed in east and west, and all of that uh, is automatically scraped and uh, presented centrally in one single place. So let me give you a quick glimpse of that as well. Now this is, uh, this is a dashboard that is, uh, that is actually capturing some of the metrics, some of the service level objectives metrics that we spoke about early on. The first two metrics here is about the platform's availability itself for developers, not for users, but the actual developers, establishing what the, identifying what is the actual error budget available uh, from a platform standpoint in all the time from the beginning of the day to now. Uh, so this really gives you that unified visibility, not just sort of for the East Foundation, but also the West Foundation. So in one single place, you can look at, hey, is there any disparity between the two different regions? Or you can, uh, th this is all Grafana, so all the uh, awesomeness of uh, Grafana and Prometheus, uh, you can use it to its fullest. And w in one single pane of glass, you have visibility across uh, multiple regions. Now, one thing uh, to call out here is the, we have separated this particular uh, sample dashboard uh, separates out the applications availability and the platforms availability, going back to uh, what I was uh, talking about earlier. Okay, um, we will wrap up very quickly. I know I've been asking a lot of questions. I want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions as well. A few things to take away here. Um, you know, as I said right at the beginning, do not default to just active-active or even active-passive. Understand the service level objectives of your business, of your app owners. If it is just about 99%, just a single foundation, just a single region actually accomplishes that. Uh, do not over-engineer, uh, be, be economical, right? So when you do need to get to those higher levels of uh, resiliency, 99.9% .9 or greater, uh, establish those SLOs based on the application needs, uh, understand the, the, what, what the puts and takes are, and a lot of times it's a mix of both active-passive and active-active that will uh, help you accomplish what you need. Uh, and you do that choice, make that choice based on the applications. From data standpoint, uh, PCC is 
pretty cool when it comes to providing the data replication. There are other options too. MySQL has capabilities. Uh, some of, there are third-party vendors who provide some of those capabilities, or even the public cloud providers themselves have uh, some of these options. Now, make all those choices based on uh, what is economical, right? So. You might, it might be that the, um, you know, you're going to make your choices based on, hey, am I going to bind to a particular API? Am I, uh, uh, am I looking to have multi-cloud resiliency as well? So all those factors go in there. And ruthlessly automate everything, measure everything, learn from that, and adapt as you, as you need to. Uh, these slides, when they're available, uh, all the links to the stuff that we have will be uh, available. You, you can easily access it. The white paper and the spreadsheets I referenced. Uh, we'll add the PCC, uh, the actual application uh, GitHub repo link there as well, the platform automation. I didn't talk about CF management. That's another neat tool for the operators where you can ensure consistency in the orgs and space configuration across regions. Uh, check that out as well. And... Um, there are a few other talks. Uh, there's one today around Spinnaker and Concourse at 4 o'clock, 4.20. Um, square pegs, square holes, I mentioned. Uh, this was yesterday, so go check it out on YouTube when it's available. And uh, the other one later today at 2 o'clock around, is around Pivotal Cloud Cache and uh, Geo. They actually walk you through a sample app on how to build, uh, build the app in a cloud-native uh, fashion. And credit... Uh, to Corey Innes, he's here. Uh, he's a practitioner, so if you guys want to talk to him, if any of you in the audience, feel free to catch him, uh, and also to the Customer Zero team. Uh, with that said, we want to open up the floor for questions. Uh, any question, people who have questions, I would request you all to walk up to the mic here, and if you can, go ahead and ask a question. Uh, so, so the question was regarding the split brain situation with PCC. Um, there are algorithms that come out of the box in Gemfire to help address and resolve those when, it, when uh, Cloud Found, or Gemfire uh, identifies those, or you can write some of your own algorithms as well if you have you know, particular needs of how you want to address those challenges. So um, that's probably all I'll get into right now. Maybe we could uh, take this conversation outside or um, maybe attend one of the other talks on Gemfire. So from, um, from a Spinnaker um, Canary deployment standpoint, right, between the existing version that runs in production and the new version, um, how do we split the traffic, like, you know, kind of 10%, 90%? Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And the question was, how do you split traffic across the instances when I did the Canary baseline deployment into uh, my production space on Cloud Foundry. Uh, so what I've done in the manifest defined on uh, the Spinnaker configuration is register a unique route to the Canary and the baseline, but also register those application instances with the primary production route. So the Pivotal Platform Go router is going to spread the traffic uh, across all of the six application instances in that case. Got it. Now, is there a way that you can specify saying I want 10% to go to my new version so, so it's 90%? Sounds like you're, you're interested in the, uh, the Istio routing functionality that has been added to the Pivotal platform in, in 2.6 and continued to extend in 2.7. Okay. So that, that's how you would start to uh, utilize and, and um, implement the, the more weighted routing functionality. Right. Thanks, man. Uh, maybe just one more, one more question. And then otherwise, Caldini and I will be outside. Uh, happy to talk to anybody. Is the new reliability uh, thing you were talking about, is that designed to replace the PCF Prometheus price pipelines project then? So the question was, is the reliability view, uh, see, I'm going to call it a product, uh, is it designed to replace PCF pipelines? The, no. From PCF Prometheus pipelines. Okay, the PCF Prometheus pipelines. So. Going forward, uh, we believe uh, reliability view is where uh, the Prometheus uh, and sort of the platform metric data is going to be consumed. Uh, right now, it still has a dependency on Health Watch. Uh, so some of those metrics that you saw up there on the dashboard are actually being captured by Health Watch, and reliability view uh, was scraping those. Uh, we are looking to consolidate that much more. We, I believe Jacob Newton, who is the product manager for that, is here as well. We'd be happy to connect you with him, and uh, you can get more granular information about that. 
Well, thank you all. It was Thanks a pleasure everybody. to present. Katie.